and I think it's it's sort of a reframing of how how you uh, think of this kind of citrus because because yes, if you're looking to take a a big bite into it and expect it to be like a lovely sweet tangerine or or navel orange or something, it'll definitely disappoint. But used as sort of a ingredient, almost used like a spice, you know, like you might use the the Thai lime leaves or something like that. It's really pretty cool. Listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story. I'm your host, Emma Biggs. And I'm Stephen Biggs. We talk to creative food gardeners and farm and garden experts who break the rules and make new ones too. When I was a student, I spent a summer working at a nursery in the UK. The nursery had the UK National Collection of Citrus, along with other fun plants like figs. But yeah, citrus in the UK. Clearly, the UK isn't the epicenter of world citrus production, but there's a vibrant gardening culture there and a long tradition of growing citrus in pots and in conservatories. Back home here in Canada, a decade later, my neighbors Joe and Gina gave me a lemon tree. Joe had grown it from seed in 1967, before I was born. And then when he realized he'd be better off with a grafted tree, a neighbor helped Joe graft a fruitful variety atop that tree he'd grown from seed. I have that tree today. It's a family heirloom that I'll give to my kids one day. That tree from Joe and Gina really kick-started my curiosity about citrus. And fast forward another decade, I was visiting a nursery on Vancouver Island, and I was astounded to see yuzu, a citrus prized in Japanese and Korean cuisine, growing in the ground. Pushing hardiness limits and cold-hardy citrus is what we're talking about on the show today, and we have a really fun chat lined up with Sam Hubert from One Green World Nursery. Sam got the citrus bug while living in New England and realizing that he could grow trifoliate orange there. He'll tell us about trifoliate orange and then take us way beyond that with an array of cold hardy citrus, some of them you can eat right off the tree. You can find Sam and One Green World Nursery at onegreenworld.com. Now, here's our chat with Sam Hubert. Sam, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's great to have you here, and we're very excited about talking citrus and cold hardy citrus tonight. Can you start us off, Sam, telling us about how you got into growing citrus? Yeah, totally. Um, so I grew up uh, here in Northwest Oregon, Portland area, um, but actually didn't get into growing citrus until I was living not too far from you all uh, in Vermont over in in New England. And I was at the time, I think going a little bit stir crazy from (laughs) winters there, which can be uh, much rougher than (laughs) what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was just like germinating a bunch of seeds in my room and in a greenhouse that I had access to and taking a bunch of cuttings and sort of just trying to explore uh, all the different things that, that I might be able to grow there. And there's a wonderful um, seed company, sort of seed bank almost, called JL Hudson. And I was ordering all this stuff from them. And they had Ponsiris trifoliata, the the bitter orange or the trifoliate orange. And uh, they, lift, they list the USDA cold hardiness zone on all of their seeds. And so I was going through and saw this citrus relative party to like zone five which um where i was in vermont was a zone five and i thought well this is pretty cool let's try to grow this and so i germinated all these bonsai seeds and uh started growing citrus in vermont and we planted a bunch out and um i think a lot of them died but some of them survived because at the time i i i didn't know i just thought this thing must be hardy and so planted them out at a very small size and I don't know how many made it through their first winter, but I was just back there this summer and got report that uh, summer's still going. So that's what first got me into sort of the unorthodox 
cold, hearty citrus, things that are not quite uh, like a big Washington navel orange, the Ponsiris are these small, sort of uh, lumpy, bitter, but really aromatic, fragrant fruits that are pretty unique. I've heard of some people actually making marmalade out of them. And then I've heard people from more warm climates speak quite disparagingly of them because they have other options and liken them to kerosene. But I've heard mixed reports. <laughs> yeah, totally. And and I think it's it's sort of a reframing of how how you uh, think of this kind of citrus because because yes, if you're looking to take a a big bite into it and expect it to be like a lovely sweet tangerine or or navel orange or something, it'll definitely disappoint. But used as sort of a ingredient, almost used like a spice, you know, like you might use the the Thai lime leaves or something like that. It's really pretty cool. And we had some, you know, we bring in the, every year and it'll fill like an entire room with its fragrance. So hmm. it's, it, it requires thinking of it in a different way and uh, finding new uses for it, which gets you to be a bit creative and it was pretty fun. So it all started when you were going a bit stir crazy and then you got into growing citrus in Vermont how did you end up where you are now growing citrus back in Oregon? I I think I already always knew I would end up somewhere back on, on the West coast. Um, and then it was really once I started working uh, with one green world nursery where I still am today that I got to really go down the rabbit hole of finding all these different varieties and they were already growing so many. Jim Gilbert is the, a uh, brilliant fellow who found the nursery and uh, back in like 1990. And so he had already, along with other folks, you know, who had been growing these things, introduced these things on a, on a more, you know, retail scale and all that. So I was able to go from zone five where you can grow maybe just one, that one species, the Ponsiris trifoliata to where a zone eight B in Portland. So it opens it up to like yuzus and sudachis and even hardy kumquats and different grapefruit hybrids and all sorts of different interesting hybrids of things. And so, yeah, it felt darn near the tropics going back to Portland and being able to, <laughs> to grow so many of those things. I bet. Well, the pressure has been on uh, every so often. Emma and I will talk about warmer climates and we'll say, why Why are we living in Toronto? We could live somewhere warmer and grow all sorts of fun things. So, Yeah, the grass is always greener somewhere, but then also, you know, you have reliable year-round water there and mm -hmm. there's always an advantage depending on where you're at. That's true. Yeah, and we don't have forest fires, so. Yeah, you don't have to worry in late summer that uh, the sky might be filled with smoke and I, I'm really interested to dig into some of these citrus now, these ones that are suited to colder climates. And so we talked about the trifoliate orange a little bit, the Ponsiris. Is there anything else, uh, before we dig into the other ones, is there anything else to say about the Ponsiris? It's quite versatile. So people often know of the cultivar flying dragon, and that's a one that's particularly uh, dwarfing. So it's used as rootstock a lot. And very ornamental because it has like very contorted thorns on it. And so it has a an interesting look to it. Bonsires as a whole comes in all sorts of different different forms in terms of how the plant grows, but also what kind of fruit it makes. And it also readily hybridizes with a lot of other citrus. So a lot of the ways we've found different cold hardy citrus is actually by finding Ponsiris hybrids that are, you know, different. Sometimes they're back cross. So you'll have like a Ponsiris and say a tangerine and you get the offspring of that. And it's maybe still kind of bitter. And so people will cross it again with a Mandarin or say you want it to be more cold hardy and you might cross it back again with Ponsiris to get more of that cold hardy blood, as we call it, but those cold hardy genetics from, from the trifoliate orange. So it's pretty versatile and and you can get some interesting things by doing those different crosses. They're still going to tend to be on the more bitter, fragrant, sour side of things where you're mostly using them as, as an additive, using the juices or the rind or something like that. But it comes in a bunch of different forms. So 
I'm, I'm thinking tangine chicken as you're talking about using it in different ways. I don't know why that's coming to mind. Yeah, things like that, I think, are you're, you're thinking in the right direction. I remember when I was first looking at it, people had directions for like different cakes made from it and different things. And especially the way chefs, you know, are looking at things now, uh, some really talented chefs that are using things that you might not otherwise or maybe a less skilled cook couldn't get something interesting out of, but looking for things that have like that bitterness and those aromatics and things to them because they're, they're big and they're bold and they stand out whether you're doing, you know, like a marinade, like you're talking about, or some kind of dressing or adding into like a cocktail or, or something like that. But um, that really kind of cuts through a lot of other flavors too. So, and it's not something it's not something you see every day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of big and bold flavors, we have some yuzu ready to harvest here. And for our listeners who aren't familiar with it, can you tell them more about yuzu? Yeah. Yuzu is a citrus that has been grown in Japan for a really long time. And that's where it's sort of become most popular in culture and cuisine. And um, I believe it's a hybrid of, I mean, you know, everything go back far enough as a hybrid of something, but it's considered its own species by most folks now. And it's like a, a yellow sort of the size of of an orange, basically. There's a few different strains of it, but people always ask like, well, is it a lemon? And you're like, well, not really, like kind of. And like, is it a lime? Because we have these like very, you know, sort of like strict notions of the different types of citrus, but it's really kind of its own thing. And it's not helpful to tell somebody that it tastes like yuzu. But, you know, that's what it tastes like. Uh, but it's <laughs> it's it's wildly aromatic and it's it's unique, I think, too, because we gave some to uh, a friend's restaurant here in Portland and they were making like a ceviche out of the juice. And it was like, I think a month after I gave them a, a bunch of fruits and they were still using it. And I was like, this is still from that fruit I gave you. And they're like, yeah, just a little tiny bit goes such a long ways that. um you're able to flavor all these different dishes with not not that many fruits so Mm. yeah it's a it's a really cool one people are doing all sorts of different things with it there's a brewery in portland now that's making uh yuzu lagers and yuzu ipas and you see yuzu flavored sake if you go to a lot of different sushi restaurants and that's how a lot of people know it and of course yuzu ceviches and yuzus and ramen so it's a really versatile fruit and a lot of people come to get it from us because they have caught on to the fruit and how popular it's become. And we tell them that it's cold hardy and that you can grow it outside here. And they have no idea. They are just so interested in the fruit for its own inherent qualities that the, the cold hardiness isn't even why they were interested in it. It's sort of just the the icing on top where they go, okay, cool. That makes it easier. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about that cold hardiness because it really is hardy. Yeah. One of the issues for us, actually, uh, in terms of testing some of the cold hardiness on these things is we actually don't get cold enough because Yuzu is reportedly cold hardy all the way down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. We've you know never gotten close to that in my lifetime, and hopefully we never, we never do, or we're going to lose a lot of plants. But... Uh, <laughs> As far as citrus go, and especially ones that create like really valuable, high quality fruit that's really sought after, having it be hardy all the way to zero degrees is is pretty significant. And growing citrus indoors too has some challenges. It's just, in my mind, not quite as easy as being able to grow it outdoors. And so anytime we have a a citrus plant that we can grow outdoors here, um, I think it's it's really valuable. And they also make really fantastic ornamental shrubs they flower pretty early in the spring depending on the weather they're evergreen so they have a lot going for them just besides the fruit too so a lot of people are into them just for kind of their ornamental value alone when i hear people talk about yuzu i've also heard people talk about sudachi in the same breath using them in a similar way so can we talk a little bit about sudachi Yeah, that's one that's a hybrid of yuzu and another like Mandarin relative and something else. So it's 
it's similar in a way to yuzu, but it's used differently in that you harvest it when the fruit is still green. Yuzu, you wait usually until they um, start to turn a little bit yellow on the plant, and then you harvest them. The sudachis are at their most flavorful, actually, when the when they're still green, which would most most people would consider that sort of on the underripe side of things. And so they're harvested then and usually use the rind as a zest um, and the juice and and the flesh and all that is sort of just secondary to that. But but the zest from it is so flavorful. And the sudachi too, I think it's maybe slightly less hearty than the yuzu, but it seems to be, you know, as far as we're concerned in zone seven or eight, very hardy and and also for people in in colder climates they're finding ways to get these things to overwinter using various techniques and and different things that makes it so you can grow them outdoors there too and have you know a bigger plant and one that you don't have to worry so much about watering if you go on vacation or something like that or and and we'll get to some overwintering thoughts maybe in a minute after we've talked about some of the crops well something else that we're growing here in toronto are kumquats and i just love them can you tell us a little bit more about them and how cold hardy they are yes they're for us ones that are a little bit on the cusp we've had some outdoors for the past like five years and we've been blessed with a string of pretty mild winters so they haven't really seen a true test of of uh what they can handle but Yeah, the kumquats are really cool because for the most part, in terms of, you know, more northern growers pushing the limits on on where they can grow these things, they're usually fairly early ripening, which is really nice. Um, So aside from cold hardiness, sometimes an issue can just be getting things to ripen. And there's usually a correlation, a pretty strong correlation between cold hardiness and early ripening because these things have been selected in climates where they... You know, if they're going to be that cold hardy, they also typically have a little bit shorter season. So yeah, the kumquats are great. And there's so many different varieties. Like the Maywa is really sweet and so delicious. Uh, Nordman is is pretty much totally seedless. And just, it's like candy. You can just pop it into your mouth. And uh, Fukushu is one that's become one of my favorites. It's a really thick skinned one. And I guess we should mention too, for people who haven't, eaten kumquats before uh, really the best and sweetest part of them is the skin it kind of freaks people out i think because normally like if you were to bite into navel orange skin it would be kind of like i don't know hit the end astringent not delicious but uh with kumquats it's the skin that's really tasty and then the flesh and juice brings sort of that tart acidic balance to it so yeah they're they're unique ones and you don't often see them in grocery stores outside of more southern climates where you know they're being grown in the region so like so many of the best fruits you have to grow them in your backyard if you want to if you want to taste them sometimes i have friends over and the kumquats are out and they're always surprised by seeing kumquats in the first place because they're not something you see a lot around here but then when i tell them you eat the whole thing you eat the skin they're they're definitely surprised but they go ahead and they always love them in the end yeah and and we found too that kids really for some reason kids love those like sweet sour sour patch kid kind of flavor where it's like got that tang to it <laughs> kids will come into our grass and just annihilate the, the kumquat crop Coming up, more cold hardy citrus. Along with kumquats, there are other quats, cold hardy citrus with some kind of kumquat lineage. Sam tells us about those, the Chang lemon, citromello, and more. That's coming up in just a moment. A shout out today to Michelle, who wrote in about her experience growing kumquat, a fruit with a very special meaning for her because her mom grew them. Michelle, I hope you find this useful. If this chat has piqued your interest in citrus, I have a couple of articles on the website about growing lemons in cold climates. 
also an online course that tells you everything you need to know about how to grow lemons in cold climates. Whether it's in a pot like I grow them or like some people do it in the Pacific Northwest by growing them against a wall and putting incandescent Christmas lights on them for a little bit of extra heat on those cold winter nights. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show, the show that brings together gardening, food, and the human story, with your hosts, Emma Biggs and me, Stephen Biggs. Now, back to our chat with Sam Hubert. So there are some other cold-hardy citrus that end with quat, too, and maybe this is a good time to uh, mention them. I know there's lime quat, and I forget all the different quats, but that's probably worth a mention, too. Yeah, absolutely. And this is where the citrus world gets pretty interesting because it's spread out sort of all around Eastern Asia and and then into West Asia and all over. And and people have selected either purposefully or sort of by accident different different things from these ancestral citrus. So the whole genus really hybridizes pretty freely and there's even citrus endemic to Australia. They call them like micro citrus, like the Australian finger limes. And all of these things for the most part are pretty, pretty promiscuous and down to make progeny with each other. And so you can get all these different interesting hybrids by crossing like a lime and a kumquat or a mandarin and a kumquat. And so, you know, they'll add quat to the end of (laughs) any any new cultivar that has been uh, selected with kumquat in it. And, and it makes her some really weird things because you'll then have like with a lime quat, it's, it's got that lime flavor and aroma and all that, but then you'll have like a sweeter skin to it. And I think people are working on some other interesting things where you have a, like I've heard of a yuzu quat, which it's like a hybrid of a yuzu and a kumquat. Mm -hmm. And then you'll then sometimes lose some of the really tasty, sweetness of the kumquat skin but you end up with very unique flavors that are sort of never before tasted so the experimenting and you know breeding of different citrus and places like university of california riverside and clean california citrus protection program and there's a bunch of folks in the southeast too which is another one of the u.s's more traditional citrus breeding regions the the blocks they have of the genetic material historically and that they still keep going is just outstanding because so many varieties of have, have come and gone and it's a very very diverse genus even though most people just if you say citrus think of lemon lime and orange well before we move on to some ways to keep citrus in cold climates i wonder are there one or two more that we haven't touched on yet that are worth a mention yeah, um, one I Ching lemon is, uh, as far as I know, found in the Himalayas. I believe it was Jerry Black from Oregon Exotics. Really great, interesting guy who used to run a nursery down in southern Oregon who first brought it back to um, the U.S. to sort of introduce into the nursery trade. People call it the frost lemon or Shang Zhuan. And it's, as far as like finding a really good lemon substitute, that uh is very cold hardy that one is way up on the list of you know because people everybody wants to grow a meyer lemon or something they found in the grocery store even with all these unique alternatives people often want just what they've had before the eye chain lemons are really cool one for folks who just really want a cold hardy lemon that they can grow in their backyard and and temperature wise approximately what does it go down to is it as hardy as say a yuzu or a little bit less cold hardy that one yeah it seems to be just as hardy as yuzu down to about zero fahrenheit wow. and so it's a pretty hardy one and yeah there's there's so many other there's citromello it's like a hardy grapefruit um a little bit more bitter than a grapefruit but still really tasty and then people have been coming up with all sorts of interesting 
different hearty mandarins. Everybody's always after like a hearty satsuma that makes a sweet fruit, you know, but mm-hmm. it's also cold hearty. Different now hybrids of of you know all sorts of stuff and and people are hybridizing um uh, the australian finger lime which is also a very unique citrus that is becoming more popular especially with with chefs and different folks who are experimenting with it but they call it citrus caviar because when you break it open the, all the segments are like in in their own individual thing so it looks like like caviar and uh has a really unique flavor that just kind of bursts in your mouth and and now everybody's hybridizing those together both because they're really interesting but also because there's this nasty virus spreading through the whole citrus industry in florida um people fear it'll come to california and all that called the citrus greening virus and that species is totally resistant to citrus greening and so people are able to now start crossing that into some of the more traditional varieties and get plants that are naturally resistant to it without having to go out and have airplanes spray a bunch of pesticides over entire crops and all that. Where you are, you're lucky that you can grow a lot of these outdoors. And and here in Toronto, we're growing things in pots and putting them in a cold garage or a cold greenhouse for the winter. And uh, I wonder if we could take a minute just to think about ways that people can keep citrus some of these cold hardy citrus through the winter what what are some things that you've seen or or ways that you recommend people keep them if their conditions are a little bit colder than yours yeah uh it gets into a very fun realm of (laughs) you know never-ending inventiveness and creativity from growers in in pretty much every climate i've realized you know because we think oh in the north we gotta protect things and and do season extension and all that but i was down in uh area outside of la los angeles which is you know very warm climate and uh it was a tropical fruit nerd who had all these different varieties and he had similar things that were like you know basically like miniature greenhouses and different things to keep things that were not quite hardy for him down there uh, happy through the winter. So it seems that no matter where you are, there's always something you want to grow that's going to be a little bit outside of, you know, what your climate offers to keep it happy. But it can be as simple as, you know, people use the old fashioned incandescent Christmas lights that give off a little bit of heat and, uh, just that little bit of heat can be the difference between a plant, you know, whimpering through winter and coming out looking looking really happy. Using that in conjunction with greenhouse plastic and different structures to try to keep the heat from those lights as well as the heat from the from the earth, the ambient soil temperature, which is always warmer than, you know, when we're getting deep frosts. Using those sort of greenhouse structures to to keep that heat in can be very helpful. Heating coils like people use to keep plumbing thawed out in winter can sometimes be useful. Uh, you can run an extension cord and do that. People will do all sorts of things with insulation, like throwing hay or straw and different things all around it to try to keep them, keep them insulated and warm through the winter. Then you can run into some issues of things rotting and whatnot with that. And then sometimes it's just as simple as siting it in the right microclimate. So that's a lot of what we think of and talk to our customers about, because many of these things will do just fine if you plant it in the right place. And so uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere, south facing walls are always a popular spot, overhangs where you can sort of keep some of the snow and different things off off of your plants. If there's buildings that are giving off heat, you can utilize that to to keep your plants a little bit warmer and it might be the difference of only a few degrees but that can sometimes be the difference of something surviving the winter or not so yeah there's no no end to different creative ways people have have utilized pretty low-tech solutions in different microclimates to get things to really really thrive in their winters 
I remember once reading about people growing lemons in, in trenches and then covering those with straw mats for the winter and uh, being really fascinated with that. I thought, what would my wife say if I put some trenches of citrus in our backyard? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's always, it, it depends, you know, how, how much energy you want to put into it. There's, I know there's the fig growers on the East coast that notoriously will sort of uproot and tip over their entire fig tree and cover it with soil, which is a, you know, a technique that actually dates back to, back to Europe and who knows how far back, but places in France have been doing it since at least the 1700s. So it seems kind of extreme, but then, you know, when you've tasted a certain fruit and you just have to have it, it's, it's a annual task, just like so many other garden tasks. It's sort of up to the gardener if it's, if it's worth the effort or not, but it's also can be, we often think of them too, as fun ways to sort of test the winter. It's almost like a barometer on the weather, you know, to see, cause there's the, the temperature readings you get from the weather station and that's all pretty clear cut with modern instruments and whatnot but um there's all these things that can go into if a plant survives winter like was there wind chill was it warm enough for the wood to fully ripen that year you know did you fertilize it too late so it's not as as cut and dry all the time as just oh this thing's hardy to zero degrees because sometimes it depends how long the frost lasts for and how warm did it get during the day and all sorts of different things so it makes people, I think, pay closer attention to their climate than they would if they were just growing things that were very easily hardy in their area. Well, do you have any fun stories about some cold climate citrus growers who are doing some neat or extreme things? Yeah, I remember one of the first stories I heard was um, this pretty wild guy, Sepp Holzer, who's like in very famous in permaculture circles, uh, is in Austria and growing things at high elevation and was touted and famous for being able to grow lemons where he was at. And I just remember thinking, and this was like a a good while ago, but thinking that's so impressive. I can't believe this guy's growing lemons in the mountains of Austria. Um, I have a strong hunch now. I haven't looked it up, but uh, that he's probably growing a Ponsiris of some sort because I think he's in a climate that's far too cold to be doing, mm. um, you know, what we think of as, as, as lemons like ponderosas or Meyer lemons or something. But uh, either way, he was doing these pretty extreme earthworks and utilizing of microclimates and, and absorbing heat through stones during the day that were released at night. Um, that was pretty cool. I think it's sort of yet to catch on in a big way here because people just often think you can't do it but um we've had folks like in hood river who were really excited about planting out big acreage of it a lot of the stories though just come from sort of passionate backyard growers who are are getting different things to survive in different ways um there's this guy jim vanstein over in vancouver washington which is just across the river from us who's one of the most passionate folks about cold hardy citrus I've met in our climate. And he has just so much weather data about everything that he's gotten to survive there. He has Meyer lemons planted outdoors that he does the Christmas light wrappings and mini greenhouses over. And then there's folks all over the East coast who are have a similar climate in that it's often a zone eight, but then, you know, like in the Southeast, they often get a, a lot warmer during the day than us. So there's Mackenzie Farms, who's selected for all sorts of different things. Um, North Carolina State University, I know, is doing some cool stuff with that. Growers in Georgia are messing around with it. Uh, Texas has released a few cold-hardy mandarins that are pretty interesting. And then a lot of folks here in the Northwest are now really starting to to grow a bunch of a bunch of yuzus and and sudachis and other things, but. Um, and some of the stories too come from people who just didn't know that they couldn't do it. So they planted a thing outside because, you know, they grew up in, in whatever place they came from. And, and then they, you know, maybe moved here and didn't have as much historical context of the climate or, or maybe they knew something we didn't, which is that this thing would survive where we didn't think it would. So there's a lot of stories we've heard of people bringing 
citrus from whatever country they they migrated from and planting it outdoors and it just happened to be hardy so sometimes we find out what works by happy accident i guess well it sounds like there's lots going on with citrus which is exciting and i wonder at this point i'm sure some listeners will be excited about the idea and i wonder if you have just a couple of top tips for people who are thinking now about getting started with citrus what would you recommend to them I don't know. For me, starting things from seed was so exciting, but it takes a lot longer. Some people stay don't don't start too fast because you might be disappointed if you lose a bunch. But they're they're somewhat finicky in some ways compared to a lot of plants, um, just because they need a lot of feeding and particular soil types and all that. But I think I think it's one that uh, we found is so much easier to grow in ground outdoors than it is inside mostly because we you know take care of hundreds of potted citrus plants and it's such a relief to have ones that are outdoors that we really don't think about that much um, outside of their annual fertilizing and all that so I guess one thing would be don't skimp on the fertilizer citrus are kind of like blueberries in that they really need to be well fed or they won't they won't perform well for you a lot of plants you can kind of get away with you know, being laissez-faire about how you fertilize them, but citrus are ones that if you don't, if you don't feed them, they, they might not bloom and produce a lot of fruit for you. Be bold with experimenting with them. That's how we found so many different things uh, that work well for us and finding different, different rootstocks that work really well. That can be a big thing. We didn't really touch on that, but various rootstocks can sort of determine cold hardiness and when plants go dormant and all that so messing around with that versus plants that are on their own roots um and i think just try varieties that are are more off the beaten path because everybody wants to grow you know like a washington navel orange but you can go to the grocery store and get that for like you know a pretty reasonable price and things like yuzus and sudachis and kumquats and a lot of these things we've talked about are not easy to find or sometimes totally impossible to find in your area unless maybe you have a specialty grocery store that that sells them um so we always try to encourage people to branch out with which varieties they're trying and they can be difficult if you've never tasted it before because you're like well how do i know if i'm gonna actually like this but uh, a lot of these things i think people you know once you once you know you can grow it you sort of learn how to learn how to love it you adapt to the fruit almost and find different recipes and and different things for what does really well in your area that's some really great advice yeah be bold and courageous and you know sometimes plants die but just take backup cuttings and you can always start again well before we wrap up can you tell us about one green world nursery So we are a mail order, but also a retail nursery located in Portland, Oregon. Um, We sort of grow stuff all around the Portland area, but our retail spot and where we ship everything out of is over in Southeast Portland. And we basically specialize in everything edible, specifically edible fruiting trees and shrubs from all over the world. And A lot of them are plants that people haven't necessarily heard of. Things like sea berries or goomies or some of these cold hardy citrus or even things like, you know, different Russian quince or jujubes or persimmons, as well as apples and pears and cherries and plums and all those more traditional orchard fruits that people think of. It sounds like a a, a fun place, Sam, and uh, it makes me wonder, do you get to graze as you work? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, We have, you know, the whole retail area is planted out with tons of fruiting plants. And so there's there's always plenty of, of snacks to be had, especially in summertime and fall. And so many unique plants, too, that uh, folks on our staff are creating recipes for all the time and and making different things out of that, you know, can be the key to key to unlocking that fruit for somebody, you know. If you have the right recipe, suddenly it becomes incredibly valuable. 
Well, Sam, it's been really great talking to you today. I know I'm very pumped up about a whole bunch of types of citrus I might make dad buy plants for. And so, yeah, I'm really excited about citrus. I know our listeners are too. So thank you for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. That was our chat with Sam Hubert, and you can find Sam at onegreenworld.com. What did you think? Because I love cooking, I love the bitterness and aromatics that a lot of these lesser-known citrus can give us in the kitchen. I've used grapefruit rind in chicken and pork marinades before, and now I'm wondering what citramello rind would be like. Sam mentioned a yuzu IPA beer, and that sounds really good. If this episode piqued your interest in citrus, tune into the episode entitled Farming Cold Hardy Citrus in South Carolina. And in that episode, we chat with Stan McKenzie, a citrus grower specializing in cold hardy citrus. As we wrap up today's episode, I'm thinking about my late garden writing colleague, Bruce Zimmerman, from the Niagara region here in Ontario. Bruce gave me my first trifoliate orange plants, seedlings from an in-ground trifoliate orange tree that had survived for a couple of decades outdoors in his St. Catherine's backyard. The podcast is back next Thursday, but before that, don't forget that next week's show starts off on Wednesday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, as our live radio show on realityradio101.com. You can send in your questions live. And we have a great show lined up. Linda Vader joins us to talk about edible landscaping and her book, The Elegant and Edible Garden. And then Sunday Harrison from Green Thumbs Growing Kids tells us about getting kids interested in plants and getting them in the dirt. Do you have feedback or show ideas? Or just want to connect? Find us at foodgardenlife.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, where our handle is Food Garden Life. And you can find me on my website, emmabiggs.ca, and on Instagram as emmabiggs underscore grows. You're listening to the Food Garden Life Show. I'm Stephen Biggs. And I'm Emma Biggs. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm.